All right, we are all set and we are ready, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your patience. It is now my pleasure to invite on stage Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Heng Sui Kiet, to come on stage for his keynote address. TPM Heng, please. Minister S. Iswaran, SMS Chi Hong Tat, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you who are here and those of you who are online. Thank you for inviting me to deliver this lecture at the opening of the Singapore Maritime Week. I last spoke to some of you at the Global Maritime Forum towards the end of 2019, but that occasion seems like a lifetime away. The seas were already choppy then. The global trading system was under stress from trade frictions. The sector was grappling with overcapacity while having to make additional investments to comply with IMO 2020 sulfur emissions cap. None of us could have expected the COVID-19 storm that would hit us. The pandemic turned the world upside down, the world we knew upside down, and precipitated the largest economic crisis in a century. Thankfully, the maritime sector persevered, continuing to move goods and essential supplies around the world, keeping the world economy going. Just as we were hoping to exit the storm with the receding of the Omicron wave, another one struck, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The dark clouds are only just gathering. The Ukraine crisis will put the brakes on global recovery. Oil prices are at an all-time high, adding pressure to global inflation and increasing the risk of stagflation. With the silver airspace over Ukraine closed, some flights have been cancelled, while those still operating are taking longer routes. Companies are also avoiding the China-Europe rail lines which run through Russia. The reduced and rail cargo capacity and the resulting higher costs have put a greater strain on shipping. The armed conflict has also disrupted shipping directly. More than 100 ships are stuck in the ports in the Black Sea, with several damaged due to the conflict. With Russia and Ukraine accounting for 15% of the global seafaring workforce, there could potentially be manpower disruptions to the maritime sector. Even if military action in Ukraine ceases, the invasion has irreversibly accelerated the tectonic shifts in geopolitics. So, it is in this context that we are gathering today, with one storm receding behind us and a new one clouding the horizon. In this stormy seas, there are many preoccupations and urgent tasks to deal with. But one key reason to be optimistic is that the fundamentals of the shipping industry remain strong. The fundamentals of the shipping industry remain strong. Shipping remains the most cost and carbon efficient mode of transportation. Despite the pandemic, global trade hit a record high last year with over 80% of the trade volume carried by sea. Despite the current uncertainty, the medium term outlook for the global maritime industry is good. But to realize this potential, we must deal with the challenges and opportunities. So the theme of this year's Singapore Maritime Week Transformation for Growth is most appropriate. So in this spirit, let me suggest three areas of transformation that the sector must focus on. And I'll illustrate each with a statistic. The first statistic is that the global container shipping rates increased more than four times in 2021 compared to pre-COVID-19 level. The storm has lifted the maritime industry, providing much-needed reprieve after the struggle for profitability in recent years. In the near term, this is positive for ports and shipping lines. But this will not last, and we should not expect it to. Presently high rates, persistently high rates will dampen trade and undermine the lifeblood of the global economy. Shipping capacity is stretched now. New capacity 
is coming on stream over the next few years. Herein lies the risk that excessive investment in shipbuilding now could eventually lead to another capacity glut, which we saw after the global financial crisis. The shipping industry is, a highly, cyclical, is highly cyclical, prone to boom and bust. Large swings in shipping rates not only create huge uncertainty for trade and economies, but is also disruptive for attracting and growing the maritime sector. It is inherently difficult to eliminate economic cycles of all forms, including the shipping cycle. But we can moderate the cycle by having greater awareness of this risk and working together to adopt a discipline of measured and continuous investment. The second statistic is that on average in 2021, the reliability of vessels arriving at ports on time has more than halved to around 35% from around 78% before the pandemic. So down from 78% to 35%. This is partly due to the disruptions to manpower and logistics brought on by COVID-19 and lower investments in capacities in the down cycle years. But stripping away the cyclical and COVID effects, the statistics also shines the spotlight on the potential for us to significantly improve the efficiency of entire supply chains and capacity to adapt to evolving circumstances. There's even greater impetus to do so as the maritime industry will need to adjust to the reconfiguration of global trade flows and supply chains. The major enabler is digitalization. Digitalization can enable the better tracking and optimization of the flow of goods. Going digital can also reduce the voluminous paperwork, which often requires the same information fields. The third statistic is that the maritime sector has to reduce absolute greenhouse gas emission by 50% by 2050, compared to 2008 levels. If the last two years seemed like a lifetime, 30 years may seem like eternity. But in the maritime industry, this is not that distant the future because 30 years is only one ship generation away. The global maritime industry should build on the strong momentum of IMO 2020 to further accelerate your transition to a greener future. Some had earlier touted IMO 2020 as a Y2K of shipping, but I'm glad that the industry managed to make a seamless transition to using very low sulfur fuel oil. There are so many promising innovations that can reduce carbon emissions, and there is no better time than now to accelerate your transition to a greener future. Continuous maritime investment, digitalization for efficiency, decisive green transition. These are three key areas that the global maritime industry must focus on. As a global maritime hub, Singapore seeks to contribute to these transformation efforts. Let me elaborate. The first area is on continuous maritime investment. In Singapore, we are fortunate to have a close-knit maritime community. As a very small island state, the entire nation is like an extended port and international maritime centre, all integrated into one. As part of a nationwide economic transformation effort, we launched a sea transport industry transformation map in 2018, bringing together all the stakeholders in the maritime community to effect change. You have just heard from Minister Iswaran about the three essentials of transformation for the sector. Indeed, this collective approach has made good progress in the past five years, with good productivity growth and increase in the number of good jobs and stronger linkages and synergies across the economy. We are seeing the fruits of industry transformation through innovation and the use of technology, such as in advanced manufacturing. For example, Wilhelmsen and Tusen Group set up a joint venture in Singapore to provide 3D printed parts for vessel maintenance. The JV has printed and delivered more than 800 replacement parts to date. Today, I'm happy to announce the launch of the Refresh Sea Transport Industry Transformation Map for 2025, 
which sets out the collective cost for the next few years with an emphasis on innovation, human capital development, and resilience. Our key ambitions include developing Tuas port into the largest fully automated container terminal port in the world, expanding the International Maritime Centre ecosystem here, nurturing the marine tech startup ecosystem, and creating 1,000 additional good local jobs. To strengthen the translation from ideas to action, we'll be setting up a Maritime Industry Tripartite Transformation Committee, comprising our businesses, unions, and government agencies to oversee implementation. The second area is digitalization. In 2019, I launched Digital Port at SG as a maritime single window for the clearance of vessels and crew entering Singapore. Since then, Digital Port has saved 100,000 man hours each year in Singapore. But given the global nature of trade, right from the start, we aimed for this digitalization initiative to be operable across the world to enable industry players to reap greater efficiency. In 2020, we went beyond Digital Port to embark on Digital Oceans, an initiative to harmonize data standards to achieve ship port data exchange interoperability. PSA International and five other international partners are working together on this project and we welcome more to come on board. This morning, we are taking this digitalization effort one step further with the development of Oceans X. Oceans X is an API marketplace to facilitate data exchange. They will enable us to scale digitalization more easily and quickly. When two parties seek to link their systems for data sharing, an API will need to be developed. Each time an additional party joins, a new API is potentially needed. This approach is not only onerous, but the proliferation of APIs adds to the complexity of systems over time. With the Ocean's X API marketplace, parties can search through the list of standard APIs for maritime data sets to see whether an existing one meets their needs, in which case there is no necessity to develop a new one. Streamlining the APIs used will further improve efficiency. For example, the Port Clearance API, which companies can use to directly link their systems to digital port, can save up to 100,000 additional man hours of processing time annually on top of the savings already achieved. Beyond port clearances, Ocean's X can further strengthen digital connectivity between port authorities, terminal operators, shipping lines, logistics service providers, and government agencies, as well as other digital ecosystems such as SG TradeX. This digital backbone can in turn accelerate innovation in marine tech and other areas. So I welcome all of you to join us in this digitalization effort. The third area is in making a decisive green transition. We launched the Maritime Singapore Decarbonisation Blueprint last month. It has ambitious goals, which include making our ports net zero and reducing harbour craft emissions significantly by 2050. The blueprint was developed after in-depth consultations with industry and recognises the need to green every segment of the supply chain, from our vessels to our ports and marine bunkering infrastructure. While the maritime green transition is a global effort, Singapore seeks to make a contribution. For example, we set up the Global Maritime Centre for Decarbonisation, bringing together industry players, industry partners, researchers and MPA to drive R&D and to pilot novel decarbonisation solutions. The founding of the centre was made possible through an initial $120 million contribution from governments and six like-minded industry partners. A second example is the Coastal Sustainability Alliance, a partnership to support the electrification of Singapore's harbour crafts by jointly investing in a network of charging points for electric boats. Yet another example 
is the client side declaration for green shipping containers, green shipping corridors. So Minister Iswaran earlier announced that Singapore will be joining this initiative together with 22 other signatory states. We are, so we are only 30 years or one ship generation away from the global maritime emissions target set by IMO. With more than 100,000 merchant vessels plying our seas today, many will have to be replaced in the coming decades. Likewise, significant complementary changes on the port side infrastructure will be needed. As a global financial centre, some 20 international banks based here have ship finance portfolios. Singapore also has a pool of venture capital, private equity and alternative investment players here. We are looking to build a green ship financing ecosystem and to develop a suite of financing options to enable the green transition. In the coming years, the maritime sector will also need to undergo a fuel transition from today's marine fuels to cleaner fuels. Singapore, Japan and the Port of Rotterdam Authority have also formed the Future Fuel Port Network to develop a roadmap on the adoption of cleaner marine fuels. We are also a member of the Castor Initiative, a multinational coalition across the entire maritime ecosystem that aims to design, build and commission the world's first ammonia fueled tanker by 2025. I welcome all of you to work with us on this journey towards a greener future. So let me conclude. Although the global maritime industry is cyclical and facing challenges, we are approaching the future from a position of strength. The fundamentals for growth in the medium term are strong, despite the short-term headwinds. We must make the best use of this time and of this strength to transform if we are to realise the growth potential. The industry will need to focus on three critical areas of transformation. Continuous investments to mitigate the highly cyclical nature of the industry. Digitalisation to improve the efficiency and adaptive capacity of the supply chain. And making a decisive green transition. Given the global nature of the maritime industry, the maritime community should work together to address these issues. Singapore will do our part to contribute to the global efforts. I thank our international partners for your continued support and we look forward to working with you to transform our sea transport sector and strengthen the global maritime commons. On this note, I wish you an enriching conference ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, TPM Hank, for that keynote address. Please stay with us on stage. Our usher will show you to the chair as we prepare for our next segment, which is the fireside chat. Now, this junction, in just a while as um, DPM Hing makes his way, now this segment will be, they're allowed to have their mask off, so we'll give him a moment to settle in. And I'd like to invite um, Chief Executive Officer of Pacific Carriers Limited and Chairman of Singapore Maritime Foundation, Mr. Ho Wing Yu, to join us here on stage. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, DPM. DPM, there was an excellent maritime lecture. And uh, I know you have limited time with us, so I'm going to dive into my first question. You earlier highlighted that uh, sea transport is crucial to the world economy. And uh, what we are seeing today is a very uncertain economic outlook, clouded by geopolitical risk and a rather fragile post-COVID recovery. So the question I have, uh, DPM, uh, are these disruptions sort of transient bumps on the road? Or are we actually looking at something perhaps more fundamental or more structural to global trade patterns? And I'm particularly referring to the significant geopolitical shifts that's going around uh, with the, you know, our, the four major superpowers, the US, China, EU, and Russia and the impact particularly on uh, food security and energy security. 
Well, uh, when you there, thank you for your question. That's a very uh, deep question and a very wide question. So first, let me say that um, we, if you look back over the last 20 odd years, uh, the world has gone from one crisis to another. In, in the 1997-98, we had the Asian financial crisis. In the 2001, we had the dot-com bubble. In 2006, we had a global financial crisis. And now you have a COVID crisis. So I think to, we must expect crisis as a recurring feature of the global economy and these disruptions. This is on top of the usual economic cycles you know, of ups and downs. So we mentioned, I mentioned about the shipping cycle earlier. There will be such cycles. So I think the, the need for us to be prepared for crisis and to uh, build resilience into our system is going to be very important. And in the last few, you know, last one odd year since the COVID pandemic, you'll find that in addition to geopolitical risk, the, the risk of a pandemic that is so disruptive that brought the global economy to the worst recession in a century is again something that uh, was not anticipated. But I must say that the global economy has reacted reasonably well. And I mentioned that the shipping industry, in particular, maritime industry, has really been a star performer, keeping the global economy uh, growing. So I would say that in good times, we need to think about building resilience into our system. And so you have mentioned a number of uh, key risks that have coming up. The COVID-19 is one of them. Before COVID-19, the US-China trade tensions was already growing uh, significantly. And uh, the Ukraine uh, crisis will has a very direct impact on certainly energy because Russia is a very, very major player. You will lead to rethinking about uh, energy security in Europe and around the world. And at the same time, the food, uh, Russia and Ukraine account for about 25% of the global wheat export. So people are going to take food security seriously. So food security, energy security are going to be issues which every country will need to address. So in the coming years, I think you're going to see a greater need for people to both prepare for a more resilient uh, chain, but at the same time to provide for some form of insurance to make sure that you don't have a disruption that could totally disrupt the entire economy. So how do we deal with this uh, set of challenges? I'll say first and foremost, Singapore, for Singapore itself, we are very tiny nation state, right? but we are a very, very strong believer in multilateralism. And that is why uh, when the WTO round was launched, we were, uh, inside Minister Giorgio at that time, was a very uh, key player in helping to the launch of the Doha round. But the Doha trade round that sets the six to set out trade rules across the world has not made much progress. So what we've done is we started uh, negotiating free trade agreements, a series of free trade agreements, first bilaterally and then across the whole of ASEAN. And then uh, now the, the latest, one of the latest is the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. So I think it is important for countries that are like-minded, that believe in globalization, to work together to secure this framework for uh, global trade. Because I personally believe that the evidence is very clear that economic integration provides uh, for a better way for us to uplift our standard of living and that it also allows us to grow together with the world. And in that regard, I think there's still a lot of potential for global growth. I strongly support the UN Sustainable Development Goal because despite all the global economic growth, there are still many nations, particularly you know, in Africa, which requires uh, support. And I think integrating these other economies into the global economy much better will help to uplift uh, many of these people. Now, within the region, we are fortunate that we have a very great, good trade agreement with ASEAN, so ASEAN, the Free Trade Area, ASEAN Economic Community. I was personally very involved in negotiating those uh, quite a few years back. And I think it has been a good agreement that benefits ASEAN. ASEAN itself is 600 over million people, and it is, uh, there's a growing middle class. And I expect ASEAN trade uh, within ASEAN and across with the major partners will grow very strongly. So 
trade agreement is one area. And the other is, um, I think the whole uh, financing network that we can develop, that if we can grow finance, I mentioned about the green finance and so on, but there are also many other areas. And doing the, this whole digitalization trend uh, will be important. So it is important for us to, I believe countries need to have this belief that economic competition is not a zero-sum game. In fact, it is a spur to greater improvement. But for countries to benefit from this integration, you need to restructure the economy. And that is why I think this theme of transformation is important. Uh, we, are, we need to learn how to use resources much, much more efficiently, uh, in particular resources with a constraints, you know, like your carbon constraints. So where there's energy, uh, and uh, so the more efficient we can be. And I believe that the coming uh, Industry 4.0 uh, digitalization trend is going to transform every sector in the, of the global economy. And we must write on this. And if we can, we can make a successful transition, a, a transition that involves digitalization, a transition involving going green. Thank you, DPM. Uh, building resilience, so I'm hearing from you, DPM, as well as also continuously adapt to global risk and seek opportunities. So, DPM, perhaps um, a related question will be, you know, um, what do you see are the real opportunities and silver linings for Singapore? Well, uh, I, you know, I, I'm an optimist. I, I like to uh, work on things which are, are possible. So I'll say that, you know, Singapore is a very small economy. It doesn't threaten anybody who you like to be friends with all. So our opportunities will be first and foremost, you know, since this is a trade about, this is a Singapore Maritime Week. We have been a very major maritime uh, center, uh, global maritime center for, for many, many years now. And I would say that the maritime sector is clearly one great opportunity. I mentioned that, you know, despite the pandemic, despite all the disruptions that are going on, actually global maritime trade increase. It has been very difficult for everyone I know because uh, where there is disruptions in the ship, disruption in the port, and the poor seafarers having to stay on board for a long time now. Uh, so I think the, but the, the maritime industry has proven its resilience. And as I said, you know, the maritime uh, sea transport is the most carbon efficient, you know, most energy efficient, most carbon efficient. So we should build on that. But at the same time, uh, the other major area that we are working on is this whole industry transformation. And there, I would just point out two things. One, the impact of uh, technology and innovation. I, I firmly believe that digitalization and the new technologies will be very significant. So if you're not prepared for it, you'll say it's a disruptive technology because it disrupts my operation. But if you are able to write on this, it's going to catapult you into a very different position. So we must invest in uh, technology and innovation. So on Singapore's part, uh, we, are, we are devoting 25 billion Singapore dollars between now and 2025 to invest in uh, R&D, to invest in our universities, in our polytechnics, to invest in centers of innovation, to work with companies in this transformation. So I very much look forward to that. And the other area is really that one major reason why you have such a global pushback against globalization is that the interests of workers have not been taken care of. So if workers feel that, well, yes, the economy has grown, but you know, all you uh, rich businessmen have become richer and uh, inequality is growing, what is in it for me? Now, fortunately, uh, the same debate took place in the very early years of Singapore's independence. But uh, you know, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, our founding prime minister, forged a very good relationship with our workers, with our unions. And this tripartite framework that we have been having has been an extremely strong one. Earlier on during the launch of the ITM, I'm very happy to see uh, Sister Mary Liu from NTUC and her colleagues from the Port Workers Union. We need to, in our transformation effort, we must bring our workers along so that they can master the latest skills, uh, technology, and move up the value chain. And uh, I think Singapore's education system has been reasonably good, and I believe that the next phase of our transformation is adult education, workers' education. 
Thank you, DPM. Very happy to hear the maritime industry, you know, continue relevance and importance for Singapore. And, um, you know, all of us in this room are working very hard to make sure that we continue to stay relevant and transform. Absolutely. Which leads me to my next question, which is sustainability, which is nowadays a must-have. So, DPM, um, amidst all this, you know, uh, cloudy uh, 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 landscape of geopolitical inflationary risk, it's also clear that we must press on in the field of sustainability. And this could be a potential sweet spot here. So my question is that, how can Singapore play a catalytic role in making a decisive green transition, as you mentioned in your speech, uh, DPM? For example, does Singapore have the ambition to play and lead at the global level, working with uh, intergovernmental organizations, commercial international bodies, to set standards, for example? Well, when you, I think that's a very important question. So first, I must say that Singapore takes the green... Uh, takes climate change seriously. We are low-lying island states. If sea level rises a lot more, we'll be completely wiped out. So it's an existential threat to Singapore. Uh, therefore, uh, we have actually announced that we'll be setting aside at least $100 billion to build up our coastal defences. In fact, I personally went to the Netherlands to see how they build polders, and we are trying out some of this. So we take it very seriously. And I believe that uh, MPA and our uh, Ministry of Transport uh, colleagues have been together with the shipping industry, have been working hard on this. So that's why we, we must make a, and I'm glad that IMO has set up a 2050 target to, to reduce the emission by at least 50%. So what are the few things that we can do and that we should be doing? One is that we should attract, you know, uh, and welcome global players here to answer the big questions of what needs to be done, how do we test bed solutions, how do we scale the solutions, so last month, I mentioned we launched the Maritime Singapore Decarbonization Blueprint 2050. So this sets out the, our strategies for uh, sustainable maritime Singapore. The other, you mentioned about leading global standards. So we are uh, hoping to push the frontiers and uh, we have launched the LNG bunkering standards. They will provide a clear framework, regulatory framework for, conduct, for the conduct of LNG bunkering in Singapore. And we also look forward to working with others to set regulations and technical standards for ammonia uh, bunkering. Now, the second area which I mentioned earlier is really on R&D, and I mentioned the $25 billion that we devoted to it. Uh, one key, uh, two areas which directly affect all of you here is one on sustainability and another on the maritime transformation. Because uh, the, there are a lot of scope for transformation of the maritime sector. So how do we innovate in, in this regard? And whether it is, uh, I mentioned about 3D, you know, 3D printing in my speech. So we have a National Research Foundation and our Agency for Science and Tech, at which we will be happy to work with everyone. In fact, they've been working on this, pushing on 3D uh, printing, digital twins, and so on. So any system that is much more efficient will also be much more carbon efficient. And the third is on the green financing. Singapore is a major financing hub, uh, and that I think green financing has a lot of opportunities. Well, we must mobilize capital of all forms, be it the venture fund, private equity, alternative investments, and the banks itself, for to set the standards for a green transition. And in fact, I recently discussed with a, a banker from Germany, who was very keen to do more in Singapore on this uh, whole subject of green financing. And the MAS does have a very good plan to look at how we can develop green financing as part of our longer term future for the world. Yeah. Thank you, DPM. Yeah. Um, I heard that you, you used the term decisive, yeah. which very much uh, signal and emphasize the intent and the resolve for green transition. Very happy to hear that. And I'm sure many of us in the room absolutely agree with the resolve. And, um, and the idea that the collaboration and the daring to innovate are key to green transition. Which brings me to my point that, you know, for us to accelerate the collaboration is leadership. And what I'm hearing from you, DPM, is the government is working to engage and facilitate a lot of joint actions AFAs, so that's very, very good for the industry. 
and also hear from you your, your point about green financing so that we're able to bring our green ambitions to life. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, DPM, I'm going to go on to my final and third question, which is around people and talent. It's a question that is close to the hearts and minds of everybody. DPM, you mentioned this just now. I recall that you mentioned this in the uh, SBF APEC Summit a couple of uh, weeks ago. I also heard Minister Iswaran mention this as well. And my question is really around, you know, we are, we are in, in, in a, an environment where it's increasingly compressed change cycle and our ability to see the risk, seize the opportunities, as you said, is absolutely crucial. And as a CEO myself, uh, a key enabler of this is talent, as talent is in the heart of, you know, of all transformation. So as a global maritime business, I'd like to seek your thoughts on what do you see is the future of work and what are the future skills that Singaporeans would need to not just cope, but really thrive in this landscape? Well, Wingy, I think that's a very important question. So I would say, uh, let, let me answer it in, in two parts. One is the first, the future of uh, work depends very much on the future of the maritime industry. And I think there is a very bright future for the maritime industry. But that future is a future that needs a lot of effort to transform. And where does the transformation, where would the transformation lead to? I think a, a greener maritime industry, a more digitalized maritime industry, and uh, a much more connected maritime industry will be important. And in that regard, therefore, I think the workflow is going to change uh, significantly. Because that's on, on the demand side, I think there will be all this demand. On the supply side, the major uh, technological change, one major change that is coming is Industry 4.0. The importance in how the whole digitalization movement, AI, machine learning, autonomy, autonomous vehicles and so on, will be coming on stream and getting better in the coming years. So in that regard, we've got to rethink what the work will be like on board and on the ship across the ship uh, and at the port area. And in that regard, I would say that um, all this work will have to change. Uh, the, we will have to reconfigure the processes and uh, eliminate as many of those unproductive work as possible. I mentioned about the data exchange and that data exchange is, you know, it doesn't make sense to have humans inputting all those data over and over, over again when you can have thousands of man hours of saving across the world to do that. But to do that, you will need new, that calls for new skills. So the transformation will have to start from the industry, from the leaders sitting here, as to how you see your job, your operations changing, and then redesigning the jobs. Now then the next step is redesigning the skills. So uh, we take retraining of our workers seriously. I mentioned that adult learning and learning on the job is going to be critical in the future. One good thing that uh, our trade union has have been doing is that they are very progressive trade union. They, they are not the unions, you know, going on strike to uh, ask for higher wages because it's, a, it's a just a pure demand, but rather they are unions encouraging workers to learn new skills and work together with the companies to train. And the one step which the unions have done recently is to work on a company training committee which has now evolved in a company training and transformation committee, working together with the businesses to see how the work can be transformed and changed. And with that, I think we should bring the, the workers along. So the future skills, we will need to, be, to train our uh, officers to be much more digitalized, to master the digital skills, to go into areas like, you know, I mentioned about marine tech. And so there are lots of new uh, technology that are useful, marine tech. If you look at the port operations, a lot of it can be automated. In fact, I think PSA is one of the most automated uh, port operators already. But it can go further with uh, autonomous vehicles in the coming in the future. And when we redesign Tuas port, uh, they will open up even newer possibilities. And then, of course, there'll be new skills in the digital area, in dig from digital finance to understanding what green technology is all about. And uh, so it is a very exciting future, 
but we must prepare for it. I'm glad that the uh, MPA has set up this Maritime Industry Tripartite Transformation Committee and then to also work on the future ready maritime workforce. So we must equip our people well with the new skills. And you also mentioned about the AFA. In fact, a member of the audience here has been very uh, involved in this setting of AFA, Mr. Tan Chong Ming, who co-led our uh, committee uh, on the Emerging Stronger Task Force with my fellow minister, Desmond Lee. And one key recommendation that came out of that was this AFAs or Alliances for Action. And the Alliance for Action is a very uh, important innovation in Singapore's policy making. In the past, the industry will say, oh, I got these great ideas. Then they, okay, submit for approval. And the regulatory authority say, no, 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 this won't meet the standards. Sorry, go back and rework, which is a horrible waste of time and resources. So instead, what we are trying to do is to bring the industry together so that um, the industry can set out what the problems are and the agencies can say, well, this is go, no go. And uh, then they work together to come co-create this solution. So everybody buys into that. The other powerful element behind this is that I've said this many, many times that normally when industries are in this, when people are in the same industry, they see each other as competitors. And I think it is good for companies to compete to differentiate yourself. But companies in the same industry will always face the same common problems. So my suggestion is compete to create distinctive edge, but collaborate to solve common problems. And uh, Singapore government and MPA and our agencies, you will be very happy to work with everyone to solve common challenges. Thank you. Thank you, DPM. Thank you, DPM, very much for the... Uh the Maritime Lecture, which is fantastic, and the Fireside Chat. Perhaps I've got myself three key takeaways. One is the maritime industry must transform to grow and decisively tackle the issues of disruption. As say DPM, it is getting more regular and much more impactful than ever before. Uh, tackle the issues of sustainability as well as efficiency and productivity. And of course, building our future ready talent pool. And I must add here, certainly must include our seafarer community as well. Extremely important for us. The second takeaway I have is time is of the essence. As DPM, as you reminded, we are only one ship generation away to 2050. And here in Singapore, we have an opportunity to really play an even more significant role in the global maritime transformation. Work whole of an industry, tackle common issues, as always, punching above our weight. Yeah. DPM, will you have any final words that you would like to share with our, our audience here today you know, to wrap up the, um, the, your maritime lecture? Now, I, I, I know you have a very exciting week ahead, and I really am very happy to see so many of you here gathered today. So as we learn to live with the, uh, the virus, I think we should be looking forward to what next. And... Uh, I, this is such a unique opportunity for everyone to come together to now you know, exchange ideas, to explore new frontiers. And I would urge everyone to work together to explore new frontiers, including many of you who are on the new frontier of the digital uh, age. You are watching us online, but uh, I have attended so many digital meetings as well. So I think the, uh, that plays a small part in helping us to also reduce the carbon footprint. So, but since those of you who, are, who have flown in here, please enjoy your stay in Singapore and take this opportunity to uh, build deeper relationships with all the players here and identify what are the common issues and the uh, areas for which we can work together and make another, make many more breakthroughs. Thank you, DPM. Thank you, DPM, for your time, your support and your words of wisdom. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen, for that insightful conversation. Please stay on stage. We have a token of appreciation to present you. I'd like to invite Chief Executive of MPA, Ms. Kwa Le Hoon, to come on stage and present the token of appreciation. She will first present this token to DPM Heng and next to Mr. Ho. Now, these gifts are unique art pieces uh, that can be found in art faculty. It is a platform that maximizes the potential and showcases talents of differently abled artists on the autism spectrum. 
Now, by purchasing their works, we are showing our support uh, in their talents and at the same time, they get to earn royalties and to learn the value of work and financial independence. A very beautiful and meaningful art piece. Now, a token of appreciation um, to Mr. Ho. If you'd like to clap, yes, thank you very much. Applause is a great sound. It's music to the ears. And we will then uh, proceed for a group photo in just a while. To the three on stage, please remove your mask and as we prepare for a group photo taking together, our ushers will help with the art pieces. Ms. Kwa, we're going to be taking a group photo together, so you may remove your mask. There will be a mask holder presented to you. And you'll both flank uh, DPN Heng can be in the centre. And big smiles to our cameraman. Wonderful. Thumbs up indeed. A great week ahead. Please put on your mask as you proceed off stage. Indeed, I think we are getting very good at multitasking and uh, posing for photographs in spite and despite the various measures in place. So thank you very much to our two gentlemen and Ms. Kwa for that token of appreciation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as DPM has earlier announced, the launch of the Sea Transport ITM Refresh, as well as the formation of the Maritime Industry Tripartite Transformation Committee, which is a partnership with the industries, unions and government agencies to spearhead the industry transformation of the sea transport sector. So for this, I'd like to invite you to watch a short video on how we envision all this coming together. Let's watch. As the world's busiest container transshipment port, biggest bunkering hub and top international maritime centre, Maritime Singapore is in a strong position, but we have to pedal hard to stay ahead. The sea transport sector is an important enabler of Singapore's global connectivity strategy. It's the forerunner for trade and economic activities in Singapore. The maritime sector is the lifeblood of global trade and a key pillar of Singapore's economy. This creates good jobs, many of which are taken by locals. Sea Transport has remained resilient amidst the challenges of COVID-19, supply chain disruptions, digitalization, and decarbonization. We are turning these challenges into new growth opportunities to attract more business activities, grow the pie, and ultimately benefit Singapore and Singaporeans. The ITM would complement our strategies to grow our global hub port and international maritime centre. It will help us achieve our vision for Singapore as a global maritime hub for connectivity, innovation and talent. So it's very timely that Sea Transport ITM launched four years ago is to account for these new challenges, as well as also capture new opportunities in this whole new backdrop. Over the next five years, digitalization, innovation, sustainability and talent will be key areas of focus. So by 2025, we expect to achieve the vision that we've set out to do. Our areas of focus till then would be First, to build a vibrant, innovative ecosystem to drive competitiveness and new growth areas. Second, to leverage automation and to drive the productivity transformation of the sector. Third, to develop a future-ready maritime workforce equipped with global skill sets. Fourth, to work with partners to support maritime companies to level up their potential as global champions. And finally, to ensure the relevance and resilience of maritime SG as a key node in the global supply chain. Ambitious as it might be, our strategies and targets set out from now till 2025 exemplifies the strong tripartite partnerships in achieving our vision for the sea transport sector and for Maritime Singapore to flourish. To support this goal, the Maritime Industry Transformation Tripartite Committee 
is established to spearhead industry transformation of the sea transport sector. The MITT embodies the close collaborations and partnerships of the government, the industry and the unions working together for the sea transport community. Always looking towards the future as we sail towards the horizon as one maritime Singapore.